What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of For the Love of Cinema, a movie podcast where our motto is, we just hope it doesn't suck. This episode 342, broken up into two parts, A and B. B. 342A, posting on 88, will be discussion on Disney's Haunted Mansion. And 342B, posting on 811, will be discussion on Nimona, A Closer Look. I'm one of your hosts, Grayson Maxwell. Joining me, not this week, Roger, because he is on vacation. Don't even say his name. <laughs> he's gone. He's dead to us for this for this one week. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, also joining me is our lovely Kermit guest, Chris Bond. Chris, Ooh. how are you? Just I want to say that I have a mental image of, of Roger enjoying his vacation so much that he's laying on a couch somewhere with a, with a, a healthy sea of empty uh, Miller Lite cans beneath him. <laughs> like empty and crushed. I mean, at some point he was naked. On a raft floating down the river, I think. But yeah, I mean that's close enough anyway. I yeah. mean, I have no doubt that that that, 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 <laughs> that happened, or at least like, or he considered it for like a quick minute. Like, well, if I just took off my shorts, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> getting the full body tan is what he's getting. It only only has sunglasses on. Like that's it. Just only only has sunglasses on. Yeah, I, I'm 100%. sure that's. I'm sure he's enjoying his. Oh yeah. Uh, vacation. What's going on with you this week, my friend? What's new? Uh not much. Had some uh, had some work stuff. Had some family stuff, and. You know, just rewatched a we rewatched a movie so I could talk about it on the podcast. So yeah, that's about been my week playing a lot of um of Remnant Two video game wise. So hmm. yeah, very nice. Um, I've been I work's been a little weird with a lot of people are gone now. It's just down to the bare bones of us now. So I'm back at the beginning of next month. So I'm very I'm lo- I'm, lo- I'm looking forward to it. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, so I'm excited to get this one done in the can. And um, the st- <laughs> a little news on the strike is uh, a buddy. Of m- I know we had we had thought that the strike was maybe looking to like they were actually going to negotiate and sit down and come up with some mm-hmm. deals. However, and I sent it to you and Roger the story. Uh, the strike is going to go on indefinitely, at least for the time being, because the studios have no desire to negotiate. Which is funny because like the day before you sent me that, I watched uh, uh, somebody who has who's an influencer that has like movie realm knowledge and did a deep dive on it talking about like where the lines are being drawn in the sand and how like it's closer than what we think and then all of a sudden it was like nope we're not talking I was like oh okay cool that sucks well you know what's funny about that is i would imagine that what people are saying on social media probably does have some kind of influence i mean if you were smart and worked at a studio you would use that as a barometer for what people actually thought about oh, the strike So, I mean, all these things that people are doing and talking about, I'm sure the studios are, I mean, they're probably some gauge of how much time they actually have before they get, before they have to negotiate is in these, a lot of these YouTubers videos and and TikTok and all these social media. I mean, at least it's some kind of outside knowledge they otherwise wouldn't have. So, yeah, well, I mean, it's a good brother. They'd be better. They'd be best suited to get some very powerful people within the industry to shut the hell up because that's what's causing them problems when like, you know. CEOs like Bob Iger and others are like giving their two cents on the whole situation, but aren't actually the ones at the negotiation table. Like that's the problem that they're going to have. If, if, if people keep on saying really stupid shit about, you know, what people want and what they think people need while they have $21 million made last year, it's just not going to go well for, for, for them. So they, they need to focus on, on trimming their hedges, getting the right people to talk and the right people to shut the hell up. And then I think this will go smoother for them. But right now, I just want to see people, you know, not have to worry about not going like back to work and, you know, you know, put food on their plates and all that kind of stuff. I agree. It's it's a it's a weird situation. So I'm very thankful that I had my job for as long as I have it for. So, mm-hmm. yep. but it's good. So um, that's that's a new situation on the the strike. If you want to if you want to Google, I'm sure there's tons of more information by t- by Tuesday morning when this posts. Oh, but yeah. I'm I'm sure this. I mean. September, October will be they'll start negotiations and then November, December stuff will start crewing up again right before the mm-hmm. new year. And then they'll yeah, I'm sure next year we'll hit the ground running pretty hard. <laughs> well, I mean, they need content. So yeah, oh, studio yeah. or streaming service, you need content. So 100 yep. percent. All right. Uh, other than that, there's not a whole lot else going on. I did. You know, I did. You know, I was you know, I was um, I was going through the streaming services. You know, I, I stopped on something. I said. No, I'm gonna check that out. Check that out. I, th- I think it's on Max. It's um Pee Wee Herman. I watched the first episode of Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse. Oh yeah, yeah. And let me R- tell you something. R- riveting, right? It is. I completely like. I had a. I remember the set. You know, the like that that wonky shaved door, and I remember the set better than I remember the content of the show. And I, of course, I remember yeah. Paul Rubens, what he what he was dressed and what he looked like. But that show is. 
how I would say it is like that is Ren and Stimpy in live action form <laughs> and like in how inappropriate it is. Oh, listen, because everything is just pure patriarchal, pure like it's just pure inappropriateness from the 80s and 90s that no longer works today. I saw a Ren and Stimpy clip the other day. Speaking of inappropriate things we used to watch and <laughs> Ren and Stimpy break into a, into a, a a girl's locker room to be the towel guys, and at one point, girls walk through and they hang a towel on one. I can't remember who it is. One of their one of their erect schlongs. Like yeah, it's course. like what the hell? <laughs> like, how did this happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's when kids talk today about their messed up shows. I'm like, no, 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 no. You yeah, have yeah, nothing yeah. on Ren and Stimpy. Oh, I, I mean, oh you had South Park. Okay, hold on. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> South Park was in its own thing, but I still think Ren's like I mean, Powder Toast what is his name? Powder wait, Powder Toast Man? Mm-hmm. He would he would fly backwards with Ren and Stimpy clutched in his butt cheeks. Yep. Like <laughs> what is that? Because butt then, cheeks are hilarious when you draw them on a screen. I don't know are, why it is. Are. And also like the, the, the song for log. Like that's, oh, so, yeah. that's so inappropriate. <laughs> like it's so incredibly inappropriate. Mm-hmm. But I actually long for the days of Ren and Stimpy. I, I remember a few episodes really well, but yeah, it's so inappropriate. I would, never watch, I would never let my kids watch Ren and Stimpy, you know what I mean? But I watched it, you know? Of course, but, of like, course. There's yeah, no yeah. way. But Pee Wee's play, it was just, I couldn't believe what I was watching half the time. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, yeah. this made it on network television? That, 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 was it? Wasn't like Lawrence Fishburne a cowboy on that a couple of times too or something? I only made it to episode one. There was like a, a Mariner. I didn't even finish episode one too. It was like 10 minutes left. So he could. But yeah, I think Lawrence Fishburne is on a few episodes of those. That's one of his mm-hmm. things about like, well, I did it for the paycheck. But, you know. Yep. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's if you want to check. In, and also, it's an it's an hour long episode. Is like, it really? Yeah, it's not 20 Dear minutes. God. That first one was an hour long. I just. Dear God. I ate that weeding breakfast yesterday, yesterday morning and this morning before I went out for my runs. But it was, yeah, I was like, wow, I cannot believe this made it on network television when it did. But it shows you how inappropriate shows were for a very long time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but oh, yeah. Ren and Stimpy, I still think, takes the takes the cake for, you know, kids having access to Nickelodeon. Because wasn't South Park was on Comedy Central. Yeah, yeah. Was. That wasn't was available Central. through, ba- was that basic cable for a long time? Uh, or what? did you have to pay for that? Comedy Central was like was like one tier above the most basic cable for a long time. Okay, so but it wasn't like you didn't have the if you didn't if you didn't have the the package of that in it, you just didn't have it. So okay. yeah, yeah. Nickelodeon though, however, yeah, Nickelodeon man, that was. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember how you won't. I don't think you'll remember this because you're just you're not young enough, but you're not old enough. But you remember Snick? Yeah, yeah, I remember Snick. Snick uh, yep. <laughs> it depends. Well, there's a different generation of this thing. It depends on what lineup you remember. Because I think I remember mm-hmm. the lineup all that, then Keenan and Kel. Then there was always a rotating third show they kept at nine, and then 9 mm-hmm. 30 was Are You Afraid of the Dark? Yeah. Which I loved, by the way. But yeah. I've watched some episodes now, and they're, they're not too great. But Well, no, but I mean, for, for your. For your fully formed adult brain, you know, it's not going to be great. <laughs> yeah, but some of them are actually pretty clever, I think. But yeah, I. Yeah. I would, and I, I watched some of the new. Are you afraid of the dark? No, I no. It there's new ones. Yeah, there's new ones. I've watched a few of those, and it's oh, they like right. they forgot what made them fun for kids and mm-hmm. scary. Is they just it's just the what made them fun. What, great. what made them fun was scaring the shit out of kids. Yes, very <laughs> creepy, very the very creepy stuff, and like often it didn't end well for the for the good guys in the, whatever. No. Half hour skit was planned out. Like often, it like whenever Mister Sardo was involved, it usually ended up with them crap trapped in some other dimension while the bad guys won. You know, it just oh man, I yeah, I remember that. That was it was a kind of a weird kind of renegade, <laughs> you know, kid show time. But yep, nope. I really enjoyed that. But let's get on with the show. Yeah, yeah. shall we? All right. This is episode 342 of For the Love of Cinema, a podcast about movies, film, and cinema. It's posted each and every Tuesday and Friday at 5 a.m. on Podbean, which then distributes to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Each and every week, we look at the box office, current and upcoming releases, what streaming trailers and movies of the week. Without further ado, let's jump into the box office. And I already took the surprise away from you, Chris, but you will not you know is Barbie, with 53 million domestic on its third week, is over a billion dollars. <laughs> One billion thirty one million four hundred eighty one thousand. Man, that's a fast climb to one billion, isn't it? That's two weeks. Is all t- well. This is the third weekend, so yeah. Um, so two week, 
weekend, week, weekend, week, weekend is all it took to get to a billion, which is pretty good. Uh, number two is not Oppenheimer. It is Meg to the Trench, in case you're wondering what it is. 30 million bring the worldwide of Meg to the Trench to $142 million. Jeez, I cannot believe Let me just say that movie. again. A movie that I thought would make like $30 million opening weekend tops out at one forty two. I, I look. I couldn't have been the only one that thought it was going to make thirty to forty million. No, I, I thought the same thing. Like, there's, there's no way that movie comes out, you know, swinging that much proverbial cock. But there it is. <laughs> well, it must be a lot of fun. It must be the Jason Statham effect. Well, like Never- you, 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 well, you said it was like thirty million domestic or something, right? Yeah, Which, in that, 112. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Maybe, maybe, maybe a little, like a little high compared to what we thought it was going to be. But the rest of that is is foreign. That's a lot of money. It is, but perhaps you know the Barbenheimer is still having a positive effect. People are still going, you know, still Maybe. because of the, are still going to the theater. So that's a that's a good thing. Speaking of Barbenheimer, Oppenheimer number three, sitting at a cool twenty eight point seven domestic, bringing its worldwide to five hundred and fifty two, which is Jeez. not too shabby. So hold on, so so what was the so the, what was the domestic of Barbie, Oppenheimer, and um, Meg all put together this week? Well, I'll do the quick math with my. My calculator two 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 twenty eight for Oppenheimer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Meg was thirty, and Barbie is fifty three. So plus thirty. That's that's not a bad week in movies, no, that's though. Bad. That's a hundred. Can we say? Oh, that sounds right. One hundred eleven million. Yeah, that's that's right. In fifty three, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's not a bad week. That's not a bad week for you know for just no. movie going in general. There, there's been plenty of weeks where we've talked about movies and like like it's like thirty million total for all the box office because of just things not being out or not being exciting yeah. right now. So usually it's one not or two very thing. well, but yeah, it's it's yeah. I'm glad that people are going to the movies. I'm very glad. Agreed. Teenage, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: Mutant Mayhem snagging number four spot, twenty eight million domestic, bringing us worldwide to fifty one point five. Not great, not- but if you remember last week we talked about there is already a sequel planned and a season one of a TV show. Mm-hmm. Though, admittedly, I don't know where that falls in like where that falls in the timeline of TMNT, the Mutant Mayhem. They, they may do the season one and then the next film. Who, who knows? But, yeah, yeah, something like that. So, but that one I think we're going to check out for next week. Very excited about yeah. that. I love Turtles. Yeah. Number five, Haunted Mansion, that nine million domestic. <laughs> not great for that. Bring us worldwide. <laughs> Yeah, fifty nine million. I bet you the budget for that has to be much higher than fifty nine million. I'll look it up while you keep going. Yeah, I can't believe that. The six through ten, take a quick gander at those. Sound of Freedom still doing very well for itself. Its new worldwide is one sixty three. God, the movie's still going. Mission yes, Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One. Its worldwide total is four ninety three. Has not yet hit the five hundred mark. That's so that close. A, it's a damn shame. Uh, seven is sorry. Seven is Mission Impossible. Eight is Talk to Me. Nine, Indiana Jones, Dial of Destiny. And ten, Elemental. All finally, right. finally kicked out of the top ten is Spider Man and the Spider Verse and Insidious: The Red Door. Hey, Spider Spider Man had a had a good run. It did have the, a great run. The box office for Haunted Mansion was one hundred and fifty million dollars. By the way, are oh, you mean you mean the budget? Yeah, hundred. Yeah, oh yeah. For it. I, I I I could have told you that. I don't know why they're yeah. That's talk about so much money. Yeah, talk about bomb for nothing. Jeez Louise. That's just that's that's a, that's an incredible loss. Like that's a hundred million dollar loss right off the top. Not even all that. That's not even, yeah, yeah, that's not marketing or nothing. Holy cow. Man. Yeah, someone's getting fired over that. Actually, who's there's some company gonna talking about buying Disney? Yeah, yeah, that's been that's been talked about for isn't it Apple? Apple is talking about buying Disney or something. I think that sounds right, but I don't look Disney's a massive company. I just well who owns listen, listen. Who owns? Wait, Fox. Who bought Fox? Disney. Yeah. Oh, Disney bought Fox, and then, oh right, and now if Apple buys them, Apple will own Disney and Fox. Is that how that works? I have no idea how the mergers and acquisition Dep- works. Depends on on the agreements that like Disney made to Fox. Like you know, like we have to like they have to be control like the the main controller for X amount of years or something like that. Like that happens at times. I just I, I do want to point out that like something that companies will do before they sell is they'll, they'll polish a turd before they try to sell it is what happens. Right. So like, you know, they, they've had, they've had this hugely majorly good run. Things have been going like kind of on, kind of on a downturn for them, you know, more than a positive recently. So streaming, they've been hit hard on streaming record losses, all that kind of stuff. A lot of movies that they put a lot of budget into that haven't had great returns because, you know, you can say it's because people don't care about what's happening, like what they're making, or you can say, 
you know, people don't agree with like all, you know, all the subject matters and all the things that they're making, whatever you want to do. So it, a time like this is when a company, another company comes in and can buy some, you know, a company as big as Disney and, you know, think they can change things around, move some stuff. Just look at Elon Musk buying Twitter, you know, like, like, like things happen like that for the, those kinds of reasons. Or so, X. Or well, X. it's now X. When he bought it, it, it was Twitter. Right, right. But like, so like, like, you know, there's a chance that that happens it, where, you know, like Apple could, could buy it. Now, does it happen? Probably not. But, you know, if someone told me tomorrow that Dis- that Apple bought Disney, I wouldn't be completely shocked by that prospect with the way that things have gone for Disney the last no, what, eight, eight or nine months. Nor would I. But I mean, we got to we got to just take a step back and like because the whole I know wait doesn't the Activision Blizzard just taking a little sidestep here, just talking about mm-hmm. the video game world, which is a huge world. But didn't that that finally went through the Microsoft mm-hmm. buying? So they now I mean. Now, if 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 they set their sights on one decent sized company a year, that's monopoly, man. Like we got to be careful about these monopolies that we let happen because then there's no yeah. other choice. Well, our government has been very has been very picky on what they care about monopolies for. Anyway, we could dive into like, the whole the whole housing market thing and BlackRock and stuff too. About you know, if you right, want to talk no, about monopolies, yeah. you know, in, in in the United States, I don't think anyone's going to look at Apple and say, nope, you can't do that unless a lot of people challenge it that aren't Disney and aren't Apple. So I don't know. I don't think anybody is afraid of of Disney right now. I think right now Disney doesn't look like they're doing extremely well. So no, they're they're obviously they're very not doing. They're not doing very very well at all. That's the yeah. that's the issue. So all the other companies that would like oppose to it, I think they're I think they're okay with letting something go and see see where it lands. Although I think Netflix may have a problem with that, only because Netflix and Disney seem to be the two that really kind of have been their seal of quality has gone down but it's also because they have they have a they have a clipboard with a bunch of check boxes when they're making everything to make sure that they yeah. get you know that's the like so maybe Netflix might be a little worried about that because then they're going to be because Apple sure the hell won't do that well i, I think i don't think I, they will anyway i think netflix's advantage is a they're not afraid to raise the prices which we've seen firsthand multiple times in the same year and they also have a wider array of content that they make that hits different genres where Disney, while they do have other things every now and then or things that kind of reach over across that PG-13 line, you know, and like, you know, kind of play in that area, too. It's not very often that we get like a rated R Disney movie, right? It's super rare. So they don't oh, have you're right, quite. You're right. You're absolutely yeah. right about that. But then they if, don't have. But if, if Apple gets Disney, they have Marvel. Yeah, but, like, you know, Marvel's be, look, Marvel's. <laughs> nothing what it was 10 years ago but i mean yeah it's kind of i mean it's it's still a big deal you know they have more it's a big them. it's a big deal if it if it turns around but like disney has single-handedly buried their own property that they bought like oh, yeah things, 100% the the backlash from secret wars has been in, it has been wonderfully poetic to watch because it's just it has not been great for them and Everything that we see with um, Captain Marvel two, I'm sorry, the Marvel about to come out, you know, about to come out. Like there, there, there are so many things here that are that are just on a downtrend for Disney that selling might be in their best interest at some point. And you know, if Apple gets something like like Marvel, right, they're either going to a make it worse, which then we're not in a worse part than we are now. Whatever, it's just just something that keeps on torpedoing into into the into a crater, or they change things up and it goes closer to like you know something watchable or back to where it was either way it doesn't change the fact that you know right now marvel's bad you know what i mean it doesn't change right, right now no, that it, just making it, a lot a lot a lot of a, a lot of mistakes so apple might actually like have an upswing on that and i mean for entertainment wise okay that's not a bad thing for the people that are watching this stuff no but again i don't i haven't really heard much besides rumor and speculation with that oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that might not be a real thing anyway but it might not be all right, release schedule. It's not August since we are now in the very early part of August. Yeah. August 2nd brought us Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. The 4th brought us Meg 2, The Trench, and Till Death Do Us Part, and Shortcomings, which is, that looks to be a very independent, independent <laughs> movie. Say, what is that? I haven't even heard of that. August 11th, Jewels and The Last Voyage of the Demeter. August 18th, Back on the Strip, Blue Beetle, Landscape with invisible hand and strays. Wow, that week Tim's a that week it just says just just keeps changing and changing. I don't know what that. I would like is. to say that I am excited to watch Blue Beetle just crater into the ground. I'm extremely excited for this. Well, I'm I'm hopeful that James Gunn is early enough in the next progress or early enough in the pre production for the next thing that Blue Beetle bombing won't destroy him. Won't destroy DC 
from the get go. <laughs> Can you imagine? I, mean, <laughs> just, I don't know. Like I, I just I'm sick of seeing companies make the same mistake and then and then say things like I don't know why people don't like our stuff. Like oh, right, I just, exactly. I'm, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just tired of it. Well, it's just it's just how do you not have a learning curve? How do you mm-hmm. not have a learning curve? Come on, come on, man. Uh, August 25th, Bottoms, Golda, Gran Turismo goes a little wider, The Hill, The Inventor, and Retribution. <laughs> That's a big week, and none of it will do anything. <laughs> well, you, you don't think The Hill is going to do big, big numbers? I do not. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think people know what that is. I don't think um, so either. I did it until today. Bottoms, I'm sure you can all guess what that is. Golda looks like it has Helen Mirren as someone, so that might do something, but I just don't think so. Retribution. Oh, the Retribution is one of those Liam Neeson clones. So you just, you know, put Good. Liam Neeson in a situation where you have like four <laughs> sets and you fit. To, yeah. All right. August 30th, um, Slother House. That's a Wednesday. I Man, a bunch of new stuff that got put on the docket. That's mm-hmm. literally a picture of a sloth and people under it. I have to see what this is. I can't just Jesus. not. Um, it's got a picture of sloth, but a bunch of people underneath him with a bunch of blood and a bat. I can huh. only imagine what that is. I, I don't even want to. I can't even speculate what that is. So whatever. Uh, September is Equalizer 3. <clears throat> September 8th is My Big Fat Greek Wedding 3 and The Nun 2. Go go, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything this week. I actually forgot about it. But uh, it, none, none your business. So let's go. <laughs> there you go. All right. September 15th, Camp Hideout, A Haunting in Venice. What is all these new movies that all of a sudden popped up? Oh, wow. Holy cow. Uh, I am excited for a haunting in Venice, though. That's that's what I am excited for. Oh, yeah. uh, September 22nd, that's going to be a decent week. Dumb Money and Expendables 4. I'm excited for Dumb Money, though. And the 29th of uh, September, The Creator, The Kill Room, Paw Patrol, The Mighty Movie. Well, that's a weird title. Heck yeah. And Saw 10. So that that's week the- is... I don't know. That's a tough one because, like, I am slightly interested in the creator, but like, Saw Ten will be the movie of the week, I'm sure. I'm oh sure. yeah, we'll it stop there. Be. But October looks like it's got a lot of shifting things. I just want Dune back. Can you know. be Dune. Dune is my friend. You only have a couple months. That's Dune Part Two is November third, which is a Friday. Can be Dune. That's going to be a big one, man. It's going to be a big mm-hmm. one. I, I, I mean, we should do one of our B episodes in in October to like just look at dune again like a dune do a closer oh, look and just man I, I i i can look and talk about dune all day long so i'm, I'm good I'm with down, that i'm down for that i mean that's going to be a big release a very big oh, yeah. release so i am absolutely down with that let's take a look at what's streaming this week we are looking at hbo max the end of our rotation and this week my choice is of course the terminator and i talk about this movie a lot however i just watched terminator genesis on oh, one of yeah. the doing services, and that movie is bad. It starts every single time I watch Genesis. Every single time I watch Genesis, I, I'm like, "Wow, why did I hate this movie? Why did I, I? I hate this movie. I don't know why." Because it starts out with the wonderful, the wonderful Terminator music. The it's slowed down. It's very mm-hmm. instrumental on the violin. It's like, Da-na-na-na-na. like it's 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 Kyle Reese talking. In this one, he said, my parents once told me a story of how green the world used to be. I never saw it, but – and then the nukes happened, and then everything happened. Now, like, it's a great open. I didn't do the open justice, but it's a great opening. And then we get into – it kind of – it recreates the opening of the Terminator pretty, pretty faithfully too, I got to add. A lot of those shots are spot on exactly what they were. And then, unfortunately, Bill Paxton did not reprise his role as the bully on the spyglass. But then out of – and then – up at the, up at that point, I'm like, God, why did I hate? I can't know why I hate this movie. And then when Arnold comes out of nowhere, it's like, Yep, there we go. That's why I hate <laughs> this movie. Right there. So I, every time it just gets me a surprise every single time. I mean, I just want to say to you that terrible plans can have good ideas in them. So but the fact that that the fact that it opens out the fact that it opens up, you know, pretty strong and like like you said, like you know that there are highlights there. It can go to shit real fast, and obviously that one does. <laughs> like, well, one it's just the, not the, great. Well, one of the highlights is I I love how they they do in that one. Not only do they recreate faithfully the the first few shots, the first few minutes of the opening Terminator film, which is all which is already amazing, but they also do they also you know they smash Skynet. You know mm-hmm. we the resistance won. Skynet was was smashed as Kyle Reese says in the first Terminator. You know 
we smashed Skynet. We'd won. But one already went through. So I had to follow him. Like, so they pretty faithfully closed the loop. And I, I, I just, I wish like hell they would have just stopped after Terminator 2 and just let James Cameron have the ending he wanted of Sarah Connor pushing John on the earth. Oh, John, no. We see a scene of John with his daughter pushing her on the swing and old Sarah Connor looking, talking about how they, they stopped Judgment Day. Mm-hmm. They, we'd be looking at one of the most perfect two film arcs in the history of film. <laughs> oh, it just has gone to shit. But <clears throat> I love Terminator is... The Terminator film and Alien are two of my biggest heartbreaks in cinema. And it's just, it's mm. a shame that we've let them go to just complete garbage, both of them. However, the first Terminator movie I think is incredible uh, by director James Cameron. Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, Michael Biehn, Linda Hamilton, Lance Henriksen, Earl Bone, and Bill Paxton. 1984, man, that's a great movie. It's just one of those movies that there's no waste it's perfect. It's one of those absolutely perfect movies that just happened in time. And as good as the second one is, and I do think the second one is great. And many people do consider Terminator 2 to be the 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 height, the masterpiece of that franchise. And I, I would I would Terminator never 2. That. Terminator 2 is that's my Terminator film. Like like I've seen one a few times. It's a good movie. I think 2 is the masterpiece. No, I think 2, two is, is so good. 2 is I I'm never going to argue. It's like Alien and Aliens. Like yeah, yeah. I get the argument for both and yes, I can I'm not going to argue anyone, but to me the first Terminator film is far and away the better one for me. It's Kyle Reese uh, Michael Bean doing that role and, you know, come with me if you want to live. And there's like three or four lines out of that movie that like still stick around today and, and they're meme to oblivion in other movies, mm-hmm. you know, like come with me if you want to live. And it's just uh, also La Vista. And it's just, man, I'll be back. No, also La Vista was in the second one. I'll be back was in the first one. And it's yeah. just awesome. And like that, 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 that shootout in the police station, just, it's fucking legendary, man. Like it's just, it's great. <laughs> And he had, he had like a shoestring budget and it's just, I love, you know, watching him talk about him and his producer talk about how they were going to do certain shots with all nothing, no budget. And it's just, it's amazing. But that's just one of my absolute favorite movies. Um, and then Robin Hood Men in Tights. I, f- I thought Roger would want to pick, so I picked it for him. By all director right. Mel Brooks. Oh, nice Carrie, you. <laughs> Carrie Elwes, Richard Lewis, Amy Yasbeck, Roger Reese, Dave Chappelle, if you don't remember Dave Chappelle's net, he is. Eric Allen Kramer, 1993. Uh, that's a that was it was a very clever spoof that came just after Robin Hood Prince of Thieves with Kevin Costner, which was hugely successful in the box office. I think not a great movie, but people loved it at the time. You know, Alan Rickman is the crazy sheriff of Nottingham, and it's just it's very kind of break fourth wallish. And Morgan Freeman was he was in it, but like for the majority of the movie, he wasn't in it. He was barely ever there, but like he's one of the title characters. Um, and it's I loved. Men in Tights was just I thought was so brilliant. And when I saw it when I was a kid, I didn't even get half the stuff. And I still thought it was brilliant. When I watch it as an adult, I'm like, I'm just God, this is Mel Brooks is a genius on another level, man. He just <laughs> amazing. Chris, what's your what's your memory of um Robin Hood Men in Tights? Well, I mean, you've already covered a, a lot of it, but like I don't know. The the movie's comedy is just so on point. Like you said, it, it's a good spoof spoof movie. It's been a long time since I've seen the film, but it's one of those ones where, you know, Back when it first came out, it was, I don't know, my buddy was really into it. I, I had a friend who, he, like, he loved um, Knights of the Holy Grail and all that, and all that stuff. Um, all the, um, what was it, the um, the English comedies, all the different ones with, like, um, the Grail and all that. What is it called? I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. Like, bla- oh. mean, bla- like Blazing Saddles and stuff? With, with Blazing Saddles, no. All the uh, bl- stuff? Yeah, like like he was into all those. So when that came out, man, like he he loved that film and his, his enjoyment of that, his laughter of it is really like gives me memory of it from back when I watched it when I was younger. He um the thing with Mel Brooks, oh, like Spaceballs and stuff too is just great. Oh yeah, I mean, oh Spaceballs is good. Brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> Mel Brooks he's on a whole different level, but like also like uh Frankenstein, what's the I can't think of the name of it. It's funny if you didn't ask me, I would have if no one asked me, I would have been able to tell him, but I, mm-hmm. I can't now. It's uh, but he yeah, I mean History of the world, uh, yeah. Mel, Mel, Mel Brooks is a, is a damn genius, and I'm I didn't discover him like after Men in Tights for a while because I just like mm-hmm. yeah Men in Tights is funny, but it's really when I got into like high school and college like I really started to appreciate some of those Mel Brooks, especially like Blazing Saddles, which was amazing. Oh yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just holy cow. Um, yeah, it's I love Men in Tights. I think and Carrie Elwes was like born to play that role too. It's just it's so it's so many it's so many 
uh, so many layers of perfect on that one. On that one. Mm-hmm. And Chris, you chose another good one. Good for you. Dodgeball, a true oh, underdog yeah. story by director Rawson Marshall Thurber, Ben Stiller, Christine Taylor, Vince Vaughn, Rip Torn, Justin Long, Stephen Root, Joel David Moore, Chris, or sorry, Chris Dwight, Alan Tudyk, Missy Pyle, Jamal Duff, Gary Cole, Jason Bateman, Frank, or sorry, Hank Azaria, Lance Armstrong, 2004. I bet you don't remember had that many people in the cast, though. Did, did, did you? It, 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 the movie has so many people in it, and back when it came out, it, it, we, 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 we discussed the budget. It was pretty low budget. The fact that like all those people are in it in this movie is like just as good as it is. It, it's one of the testaments to how, how you can do a good comedy. Like You can't do a comedy like that now, but you, you could do a good comedy back then with low budget and a lot of the just talented people. The- so... I would I don't I think you're kind of underplaying how funny that movie actually is to like a first time viewer. Oh no, it's it's, it's funny. <laughs> I yeah, think that movie is really good. hilarious. It's, oh yeah, I mean you just got to remember the 5 Ds of dodgeball, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, I mean dodge says, duck, dip dive and dodge, dodge man. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> and then I love that video he yeah, where they're like Take Winston here, and then like Winston's a kid with the glasses, and like and then he yep. gets pelted with all the like, it's it just it's wonderful. Now, unfortunately, that's one of those movies on that list. Where, like you could never make Dodgeball again. Exactly. Yeah. You could make a sequel to Dodgeball with today. You try. But, yeah, but it it won't be. You can't do all the. You can't do the same things that made Dodgeball funny now, like you could back then. Which I think is why again I think comedy should be kind of sacred in what in you know what makes things funny because it, it it's all it's all just how you experience it. I don't know. I would love to see like another dodgeball movie made in the spirit of the original dodgeball and not just, you know, the successor of that's, you know, I don't think that's this quite the same thing. So, I mean, um, it's let, comedy should be protected is what it should be. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I don't know. Lines like, you know, no one makes me bleed my own blood. Like I don't think that, that line shouldn't even be funny, but the way that it's delivered in that film is just, it. it's really, really good. And I mean, and the, you have the, you know, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball kind of thing. And then the <laughs> wrench hits him in the face. Like, it's just all these things are so stupidly funny, but they're good. They and are good. like, and the movie just does a good job of like, like delivering that kind of comedy the whole time. And you're not, you're not surprised by that. It's like what you get the whole time. That's what makes it funny. Cause like, at, as soon as the first thing happens, like that's down that style of comedy vein, you're ready for it the rest of the time and you're ready for it and you anticipate it. And it's still hilarious. That's, that's a testament to a well-written, a well-written comedy script. I love it. I, I agree. And, 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 solid and, film. and you can't forget the, when they keep saying ESPN eight, the Ocho, like they're just saying, <laughs> yeah, the Ocho. <laughs> well, no, the, I love the, it. Uh, the commentators for that film are oh yeah yeah Gary, like Gary Cole tier, right <laughs> Gary Cole and Jason Bateman are just yeah. second to none like they just oh, the man. things they say are great and I love when they're one of my favorite things ever was in dot when they were when they were like when it's first showing ESPN eight the Ocho and like it's going through like you're getting quick quick images of all these sport like absolutely like squirrels water skiing and then it's like two almost naked men just whipping each other with belts like what sport is that <laughs> that's mm-hmm. why it's so funny it's just it's that movie hit the right time and it just was like that summer for 2004 was kind of devoid of any other comedy that really kind of measured up to dodgeball. It just one of those movies, right time, right place. And people love that. I mean like almost like $170 million in 2004. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of money for like what, what, what we said, like a $20 million budget. That's insane. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's really, it's really one of those movies. I really hope we do get that sequel for Vince Vaughn mm-hmm. because I don't know because I mean if we get that sequel that means we'll probably get the Wedding Crashers sequel if he's going to do oh my Wedding God. Crashers <laughs> was next year it all comes back to Wedding Crashers too. always dude I all love it well, well see they opened an office here in Atlanta like they they did several yeah. weeks of prep and then it just shut down I don't remember what it like while I was here for Harold and the Purple Crayon in 2022 no mm-hmm. 20, 2021 into 2022 sometime in that time frame and maybe after in the spring it shut down I don't. I think Owen Wilson had a scheduling conflict, but if they're going to do a sequel to Dodgeball, then I mean that would make sense that Vince would also do a sequel because they're they're just one year after each other. So yeah, I just yeah, think I those two movies to me are just hilarious. Like, what I was that movie them. that Vince Vaughn did that was on Netflix that we watched? It was like some, it was like a weird, like kind of funny but kind of serious movie where he was like the mob boss of something. What was that was film that, he was in? Was, it, was that Arkansas? Arkansas, yeah, yeah. I was in, yeah. yeah. So like, I, I don't know. That, that that I like Vince Vaughn in that film, but what I'm getting at is 
after we saw that film, you talked about wanting to see Wedding Crashers. I think every time we mention Vince Vaughn, it comes back to Wedding Crashers to you. And every time, I, every time. <laughs> I just I think it's funny how how much of a fan you are of that film that can never be made now. It's no, just absolutely not. <laughs> like it could not be made today. There's nope, just no nope, way. Nope. There's just no you can never that gold first of all, that that kind of lightning in a bottle cannot be recaptured. And second of all, mm-hmm. it's just there's so much that just wouldn't jive with today's politics. Oh yeah, no, not at all. It's just, yeah, it's just fucking wonderful, man. Um, and like, I don't, I don't, I just, you'd have to get everyone back, or you just don't make it. Same with Dodgeball, yeah. though. Would you want to see a sequel to Dodgeball with 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 only Vince Vaughn, not Ben Stiller, not Christine Taylor, not 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 any of the not Alan Tudyk, or you know, not none of the? Would you want to see that? <laughs> like, for them to rehash all those same characters, and then like. I don't know. I, I see something as corny and as cheesy, and and don't get me wrong. I loved it in the first movie, but like we just talked about the commentators, right? If they bring that back in, it's almost like they're just trying to trying to rehash the same movie and just make some money off of it. There has to be some something in the movie that's drastically different, but still funny in that same spirit of the original Dodgeball to really make it work and feel genuine. Otherwise, I don't think it's going to be a genuine film. Right. I want to see it, and I want to see a lot of those characters reprise roles, but you can't have all of them do it, and. That, that that's where it starts to get weird on you know is this is this a movie of you know making it you know for the passion of it or is it just because they know that there's going to be a built-in fan base to well, i mean it's one money. of those so they were gonna he was gonna lose his gym because he was yeah. he was a slacker that was his yeah. arc because he became slacker into like a guy that cared and wanted it but like that's the whole thing is like oh we need fifty thousand dollars to keep this gym running and then steven roots character is like oh here in my magazine article if you win this dodgeball term you get fifty thousand dollars like yep. weird <laughs> oh <laughs> But like if this won't be know, taxed at all, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> good call, good call. You'd, you you'd almost have to do like a some. They're all just they've all kind of slipped back into their average, average ways and average Joes, and then they'd have to like, oh, we could win this. Everyone's got to be over a certain age dodgeball tournament. Like it would it would work in the dodgeball world because it's all just silly anyway. I mean, look, Ben Stiller put a piece of pizza down his pants, then he was interrupted. I don't think anything is not fair game in that in that universe. Yeah, true. You know, I mean, it's just I don't know. I don't know what I'd like to see it without the cast, though. I that that'd be a tough call. That'd be a tough call. Let's talk about some trailers, my good man. Let's talk about Saw Ten with Tobin Bell, Shawnee Smith. Now, Shawnee Smith is Amanda. That's a big deal because Amanda was a fan favorite, and she played a pretty vital role in those first few films, mm-hmm. and she did a good job in offsetting what. I mean, it really showed us, as far as Jigsaw was concerned, what Jigsaw wasn't and how she kind of broke the rules to manipulate things to her way. But Shawnee Smith, uh, Sivon McAdee Lund, Stephen Brand, it's a movie and it's coming out very soon. But I don't, the trailer to me, does it look like it was, first of all, when I watched it, I I wasn't even, it looked like a fan made trailer to begin with. And mm-hmm. I'm, still, I'm still kind of worried it, it now was, now that I post on our social, but also oh, just, I, okay. It didn't look. It just didn't look like a real movie. <laughs> okay, well, so so let me ask you this question. You know, when you go to when you think about when you watch the first Saw movie, right? What about the movie did you like? And not not the not the tw- like. Don't talk about the twist because no one knew that movie was gonna have a twist in it to begin with. Like when you were when you were watching that movie or you went to see that film, what made you excited to see it? Was it you know the gore fest that would become the later ones, or was it the intrigue of what's actually happening here and what and like who is Saw and what is this guy doing? Right. Well, I don't think anyone knew what Saw was. That's the whole thing. Well, I mean, you had to have ideas from the trailer, right? But even going into the first one, that they they showed that this movie had the horror elements, but also had a slight mystery element to it. Like, like when you think about the original Saw movie and what made that like movie in, into the franchise it became, whether it stayed on that course or not. I think it was the allure of the of of uh, what's his name Kramer. Yeah, like it's 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 the allure of that character that really you know I think pulled people in, and then then it became this gore fest thing. I think this one is paying more more homage to the what I mean. It's twenty twenty three compared to back then, right? They can do way more with all the effects. So of course, it's going to be gorier, but if this plays towards who he was and what made him do what he did and put him down that path, and they do it in respect of the original work, instead of just going, okay, this is his reason. Now let's kill some people. I think we'll have a movie here, but otherwise it's just going to be a, 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 just a bad, a bad, what almost seems like fan fiction version of saw. You know, well, I mean? here's the thing saw to me ended saw after, to me saw was done after the third film. 
Okay. I mean, that's the, fair. The arc was like, it was, you know, when he's like, live or die, make our choice. And he kills Angus McFadden, kills him instead of like, he he does exactly the wrong thing and shuts them in the, when, 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 when Jigsaw died, to me, the series died because he was the most, and they kept kind of retconning it to make it so he was kind of in the timeline still alive. And then they brought Agent Hoffman in, which was Luke from the Gilmore Girls. And it, it's just never it never regained the magic and it always just kept falling further down. It just kept making me angry because like it wasn't satisfying because there was no way for the people to win. At least when Jigsaw was doing it in the first three films, the, everyone could have made a different choice and they all could have survived. Don't get me wrong. It's that was his thing. He never killed anybody. He made everyone make their own choice that led to their demise, whether it was I'm, greed or it was f- fear, whatever it was, they made their yeah. own choices. But Amanda, I mean, that's the game. I mean, it's debatable if he didn't kill anybody. You know what I mean? But well, that's the whole thing with yeah. like when that dude wakes up in the tub in the very first saw. There's no way he'd got that key. Yeah, so yeah. Jigsaw did kill him by. Yeah. I mean, hundred percent killed him. But Carrie Elwes was in thinking about Carrie Elwes. He was in the first saw. That's the whole thing. Like he was one of the. He's the guy that sawed his leg off. Yep. And then when he came back in the seventh movie, I was like, what the. What? What's happening here? How yet? do you survive cutting your leg off and then crawling down a hallway? How do you survive that? And then just they just kept retconning everything into like, oh well, this actually happened then. And behind the scenes, he was doing this. Like it just got kind of, it got kind of old. But Saw Two mm-hmm. was the height for me because, and I guessed it. I was one of the few that guessed it because I was like, I was, I was so on it so i thought saw i i will and we're gonna have to get through this quick because we're running a lot but mm-hmm. i did think saw if you just isolate the first saw i would put that up there with silence of the lambs or yeah. or or rather jigsaw up there with hannibal lecter as far as like kind of brilliant serial killers that they have well, a, there's a thing to their game mm-hmm. well i mean i was so like, like you mentioned you know like like you guess saw you know you guess saw too but i, I guess saw so i mean no, it's you, one of those things. you knew he was the guy on the floor. Yeah, the whole time. I, I will never. I cannot. I will never. <laughs> there's no, that's there's no way that. I mean, no, okay, no, look. I, 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 I did. I did. I, I only say that because I know you're, you're so passionate that no that no one could have known that. But well, I mean, you, yes, you could have if you watched. I the mean, movie, there's three or four when Danny Glover and. I forget the guy. The guy who actually directed the film, isn't it? Uh, Yen is he's he's the other he's the he's the Asian mm-hmm. cop. When mm-hmm. they're looking like when they almost catch Jigsaw in his like his little factory area, there's a diagram of the room with where the two men are chained up, and there is a dead guy in the center. Exactly how he's laid out, and like how would you know that unless you planned it a certain way? Yeah. So like that's the biggest clue that that's him on the ground. Like that's and there's several other things that they find that like uh, they find something that slows your heart rate down mm-hmm. and like there's, but you're not thinking about that at all. You're yeah, just, yeah, you're yeah, just true, not. True. And like when that guy stands up at the end of Saul, I was just so, I was like, what my <laughs> mind was blown. But the thing I guess in the second one was when he kept telling, when he kept telling, who was the, the new kid on the block in the second one? Um, I don't remember. Wahlberg, Don, Donnie Wahlberg's character. He, he kept saying, your son is in a safe and secure location. And there's a safe behind Jigsaw. I'm like, your son's in the yeah. safe. I was ready for Jigsaw's wordplay. I was ready for it. Yeah. But I do think the original Saw is brilliant. Yeah, less brilliant as it goes on, like way less brilliant. But And I was not a fan of the re- of the spiral with Chris Rock. I just was not. I just, I, I'm, ha- I'm, I'm happy he was passionate and he wanted, he tried to do something with it. But I, I just, I don't think it captured the correct spirit of what people like about the whole Saw franchise. I think it's a good example of what people don't like about it at this point. And it's, you know, like the violence seems to be the seems to be the first, the first thing on on the cre- on the creativity behind everything instead of like the story and the mystery involved in all of it. And I think that's where you know all the all the saws that came after Saw One, probably Saw Two, like that's where they start to go down hills because they're thinking it from the wrong angle. They're thinking about you know okay like let's do all these terribly like gruesome things and then and then build a story around it instead of you know, building that, building those things into the story of like, the story, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, it was, it was making so much money every year. They couldn't, they just, well, yeah, yeah. And then, and, and they, they legitimately did a new saw every year for like f- six years. So that's yeah. not the easiest thing to like, you have to make creative decisions. You have to film it and edit it and get it ready for Halloween. You know, you have to, you have to get it ready. So you don't really have too long to play with things, you know, but true. 
so that's I, I don't know. That's the whole thing with we've talked forever about Saul, but I'm I'm very excited to see where it goes. I'm not excited for this movie, but if it's look, I just hope it's good because yep. they're just I just have a feeling it won't be good. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the hill with Dennis Quaid, Joel Carter, Bonnie, Bedelia, Scott Glenn, which I'm happy to see, and I'm happy to see Wilbur Fitzgerald again. It's a feature. What are we thinking about this one, Chris? Why are you making me watch this trailer? Like why? Like like you know I don't want to see this. You know I have no interest in this whatsoever. I I mean. But someone does, and it's a trailer. I know, I know. It, I mean, I'm, th this movie looks fine. This movie looks like it's gonna it's gonna play to the exact audience that it's made for, which people, you know, people of of you know of faith, Christian faith, deserve to have movies made, you know, with them in mind, one hundred percent. But like, I need these movies to be something different if I'm going to be excited to see them, because I, I, yeah, know. I get that. I, I totally. <laughs> yeah. get that. But also, people do love like true stories that are just so incredible and especially yeah, with yeah, sports yeah. too it's like rudy for example like look rudy is a fan favorite by absolute mm -hmm. absolutely and you know i don't know who ricky hill is i'm not a sports guy but i imagine if you talk about Rick, ricky hill and like a, a, a amongst people who know the game of baseball i imagine you're gonna get a lot of whoa that's a play you're gonna get a lot of you know conversation starters so i do like to know this is I don't know what it is with Kevin Costner and Dennis Quaid in baseball. <laughs> I mean, I mean they're probably they're probably fans of two things: baseball and God. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, nothing wrong with that at all. But let them do their yeah. thing. It's um, I'm I imagine this movie will make a few bucks, but it's not gonna mm -hmm. you know make millions by any means. But hey, oh, God, it, no. could. it definitely could. I mean, I don't hundreds know. of thousands would be like a an achievement for a movie like this. Tens of thousands of dollars. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Ten, tens, tens of dollars even tens, tens of dollars all right let's talk about the pod generation with amelia clark chiwetel isio for vanetta robinson it's a feature what are we thinking about this weird one i don't know the beginning of this of this trailer irritates me the middle of this trailer intrigues me the end of this trip you know of this trailer kind of like makes me lukewarm i don't know like a movie like this is always interesting to see that there's ideas on it and there's people trying to make you know art which is you know movies you know about these kinds of things but I just, I'm always wary about like subjects like around this kind of thing, like, you know, like birth and then, you know, where people, you know, find themselves in their lives at different stage of like, you know, like when they, when they are going to become parents and all that other stuff, like where the priorities lie. It, it's, there's a lot of things that play into that. And a movie like this, you know, I, I just question on like who's making it and why they're making it and what's the point they're trying to get across. And I don't want to watch a two and a half hour movie because this this thing looks long. I don't want to watch a long movie like this just to get to, you know, just to get to the point where I don't understand where, you know, maybe agree with like, you know, the ideals that are being, you know, pushed with, you know, pushed into a movie like this. It's an interesting concept. And I think that the acting involved is going to be above par, especially with, 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 you know, the two leads that are involved. But I just don't know if it'll be something that, you know, actually like, resonates with you know like someone like me like going to watch this movie i imagine it won't be and i'll tell you why is because it doesn't it, it comes out like it gets kind of like stealth release in the next few weeks and then it goes yep. wider but i just there's one of those movies that people just i don't think really care about yeah because you have a lot of these yeah. movies that like try to build like a I mean, to build if you're gonna if you're gonna craft a movie that has you know a futuristic setting with people making choices based on life creating life I imagine it's going to have some kind of political slant one way or t'other. I would imagine that's probably true. Uh, I would imagine that people by this point think it's probably safer just to not go to them. So yeah. unless you can like the creator looks, I think why the, I think the reason why the creator looks so interesting to me is it's, it's talking about, you know, AI and creating, creating artificial life, which is kind of a mm -hmm. cool concept in a way, but it's just something different that doesn't really have a slant either way. It's, you know, it's, you know, humans are going to have to learn to adapt. And I think that's why the kind of the creator looks so interesting, but this one just doesn't look interesting in the same way that I remember Vivarium. Did you watch that with um, Eisenberg? Yeah. yeah. No. Um, yep. I watched that one. That was, a, I think that one's a better movie than I gave it credit for. It just wasn't my thing. So again, it's one of those like futuristic films, but it's like, it's a weird setting. It's a weird reason things are happening and it's, you really have to buy all those premises to to buy into it. But I mean, this one looks to be simple in the future. You can grow a baby by keeping it close to you and it grows in a pod. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you don't have to get pregnant. If you can't get in, if, if infertility is an issue, 
then you can grow in this pod now. But like what the movie's never going to talk about is like theft and people who target people with these pods and they break them. And it's just, they're never going to talk about any of that stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. It's just, it looks like to be a weird, a weird mashup, but it could be interesting. And that's, that's always the, the, the clincher is if it's, if it does turn out to be a good movie, then I'll, I'll certainly be happy to check it out. But yeah, same. Let's pivot a little bit, sir. We are long in the tooth. We are at the hmm. f- 50 minute mark already. No, right? no. Here we are. Let's talk about Disney's Haunted Mansion. Oh, is this the movie of the week? It is the movie of the week. I hope you All watched right. it. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I sure did. You'll find out. I'm sorry, Grayson. You'll find <laughs> out. Let's talk about some, uh, just get some, uh, cred- uh, some particulars out of the way. Now, Haunted Mansion, Rotten Tomatoes, 40%. That's about right. Yeah. You want to take a guess what the audience score is? I won't tell oh, you. Oh, it's, it's got to be at least it's got to be at least a seventy-four, eighty-four oh, percent. I'm so disappointed, people. I know. Me too. Me too. <laughs> That's just the thing. Like I can't. Like I just this movie felt every bit as long as it was, and it's just mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is some particulars out of the way. Oh. Excuse me while I sneeze. Bless you. All right. Rosario Dawson, thank you. Rosario Dawson, Chase Dillon, Lakeith Stanfield, Owen Wilson, Tiffany Hadish, Danny DeVito, Jamie Lee Curtis, Winona Ryder, and Jared Leto. Uh, that's a decent cast, I will say. Right. Yes, it is. And directed by uh, Justin Simeon, written by Katie Dippold. Now, that cast, now, if we, if you remember earlier, we mentioned, how, how big did you say the budget was for this, for this movie? This is $150 million. That is insane to me. That that a lot of money. The the movie I watched. No, I I understand. I see where it went, all the effects. Yeah. yeah. However, was it needed, I wonder? I mean, I'm not sure. (laughs) With the amount of money that that, that they made on it, I'm betting they're thinking not. Let's talk about for just one second here. Let's talk about The Haunted Mansion from 2003 with Eddie Murphy. Okay. Very campy. Every single... the, The mansion felt like a bunch of sets it was lit like sets it didn't look mm-hmm. real it all looked fake it all looked like it added to the campiness of it and this is all based on a disney ride anyway yeah so there's there i mean they're making a, a film based around a ride that's already very popular in a theme park so there was this there was a fair bit of camp in 2003 that kind of worked in its favor i think and of course, like everything after Batman Begins, everything has to be gritty and dark. Oh yeah, and this is this brings that kind of gritty, dark realism, but it doesn't it doesn't add a whole lot to this. I don't think. No, it it, it doesn't, and I don't know. So, like the opening of this movie isn't bad, right? Like it gets the point across right away. Of you know, it does it it doesn't have a long build up, right? We, you know, we meet our lead very early on too, and you know, I think his story is interesting at first, and I think he's, I think he plays this role very well. I think he he does a very good job in this film. I don't think I don't think he phoned it in. I think he actually gives a good performance. I think me and you differ on that uh, when we were talking about it before we started recording. But I like the beginnings of this movie are fine. A little eye rolly, but I, I had to keep on reminding myself that, that it is a kid's movie. So that's fine that there's a lot of convenience and a lot of like, just like lines that are very much, you know, okay, like this, this is not intended for a more mature audience. That's fine. But like this movie quickly becomes exactly what you said. The first one kind of was, it becomes campy and it becomes, it's painfully predictable the whole way through. Like you, this is a movie you could go to the restroom in the middle of it, take your time, go get a popcorn refill, get your drink refilled because you forgot to on the way back, so you have to go back to the concession stand, come back in 20 minutes later, and know exactly where the movie is and how it got there. That's, I think, one of the main like hurting points of this film. And I mean, I, I like, like, do you think it felt very, like, by the numbers predictable all the way through, or is that just me? Uh, some of it did. Certainly the majority of it did. There are a few things I didn't see coming. And I okay. thought were pretty clever, but for the most part, I would agree with you that it was. If you did walk out of the theater for some reason for a few minutes, came back, you probably didn't miss a whole bunch. No, yeah, yeah. At, at least context-wise, you did. But as far as like overarching story, you probably didn't miss a whole lot. Yeah. But let's talk about Lakeith Stanfield's Ben Mathias for a second. Okay. Let's talk about his character for one second. He is a he has when we pick up with him after the of course the beginning, which is Rosario Dawson and his son, her son chase dylan his travis 
mm-hmm. kind of coming into a new house and they 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 get scared out real quick by real moving, quick yeah r- real quick and then you know and then the opening of the guys like you'll be back it's you know that's kind of how the ride opens i think as some yeah. someone someone mentioned to me but it's and then we come we catch up with Lakey Stanfield who he's a broken man he's lost his wife he really doesn't care about anything anymore so this is where mm-hmm. i have a problem with this is i'm okay with i'm okay with this matter of fact as you and roger will recall and listener you will recall is this is my favorite kind of character is someone yeah. who's, someone who's broken who's lost something looking for reasons to continue because i think they're more interesting but i'm not quite sure that especially with someone like lakee stanfield his pedigree is huge i don't mm-hmm. think that it fits in this world, even How though they're mean? in they're in Louisiana. They're you know they're the theme of this is ghosts and ghost hunting and spectral imaging and I think him being so distraught over losing his wife and so broken about this kind of I think it detracts from the movie being as entertaining as it wanted to be okay. because like this there's like there's two parts of this movie. One's like a campy kind of weird comedy, and the other's like a horror movie. And it doesn't commit to either, and as a result, is good at neither. Yeah, but like, like if you want to keep your movie PG, there's certain things you can and can't do. There, I mean, there was more jump scariness like in this movie. However, like those telegraphed like pretty hard, but there were still like some attempts at like jump scares and stuff for kids. And you can only do so much when your audience is supposed to be, you know, rated PG. But I. I <sighs> I don't know, like his character being as as you know as broken as he was to use your terms, I think is fine. But I think you are right; you're onto something where it's like you know he was so distraught about it, but he's dealing with grief. So you could say he's teaching kids about grief and all this other stuff about a subject that isn't usually like spoken towards kids that you know they eventually have to deal with. I don't know. It, it, it's his acting in it. I think is is really well done. However, does it fit the the like the the tone of the film? Probably not, actually. Like now that you said it, like like they could have had him, you know, they could have had all those character pieces there, just not him being quite so grief stricken. But like that's how what that's what the um uh, the crump ghost like held on to, or that that's why they targeted him. All all this other stuff plays into that too. So like I don't know, they'd have to like rewrite some some material. It just doesn't. It's just not interesting. I think it's a big problem. And it's one thing with like you're just going to see this, like going to this for your kids, but I, you know, you the parents have to watch it too, right? So it has to be, so, there has to be something there. And I don't think this movie has done very good word of mouth because of something like that. It's you know, something like you know, oh, the kids liked it, but man, it was a tough movie to get through. That's going to turn people off to spending their money and spending their time. You know, this will be something that people wait for because I think the talk of this movie not being that great or it being boring or it being this or that for the adult audience is a real thing. I agree. I, I, I agree with that. And it's, it's just this weird mix of, I, I'm not even sure like Keith Stanfield was the right person to cast for this, but look, Disney, I'm sure threw him a very big number in millions. And that's why he said, yes, and he's a oh, fine maybe, get. Yeah. He's a fine get. And like Stanfield is certainly one of the better young male roles or male actors absolutely yeah. but i just think he's he's usually done stuff that's nowhere near like this low brow so i just that's kind of I mean, what i i mean doing the disney movie can't be considered low brow right you know what i mean i mean the, well, the, the, them checks spend you know what i'm saying so well doing a disney it, movie in 2023 though is different than doing a disney movie in 20 2004 okay maybe yeah <laughs> you know i mean you got kurt russell for miracle that's a hell of a movie with a hell of an app like imagine some of those movies today written by the mm-hmm. writers today it's just nope doesn't land none of it's good but it's yeah. it's 2023 and now this is just everything they do is just it, it has missing it's missing the magic that so many of them had in the you know the decades leading up to 2000 and then early 2000s it's just pure magic yeah it was well, like, a sure thing every time. Yeah, I, I, another thing like, like we talked about about uh, Lakeith Stanfield's character, but let's talk about the rest of the cast then for a second. You have a lot of people here, right? You've already said it, like, uh, like Rosario Dawson, Owen Wilson, Tiffany Haddish, Danny DeVito, uh, Jamie, Jamie Lee Curtis. Curtis. Yeah, yeah, you know, like there's all of these these big names and stuff, but like I don't even know if they were all necessary for what we're doing here, and 
a lot of their characters just i mean they're i mean again it's a kids movie but they're very characteristic right they're you know owen wilson's character is you know you know he's not a priest the second you see him you know talk you know like in his second scene rosario dawson she's fine in it you know she does a good job what she's doing the kids got problems i get it but also like a lot of the things the kid does is kind of like you know well you know, you know i i know you feel that way but that's a stupid thing to do kid like there's a lot of things baked into this film that are just over the top and it's it, it, like Danny DeVito's character, for example, is a big one. He is so, he's just Danny DeVito, right? Like he, he, it's just him being recorded while he's saying lines. It's not even <laughs> yeah. like, he's not acting. He's just being Danny DeVito. He's just, and, yeah, absolutely being Danny DeVito. And it's like, you know, why, why even have him in the role at that point? Is, is it just to get Danny DeVito's name in here? No one's knocking down doors to get Danny DeVito for movies anymore. So like, why not just make that somebody else that could like hone into that caricature feel that you're trying to go for obviously with all the other people you have playing all these other parts it, it, the movie just felt very disjointed and it didn't feel like it knew exactly where it wanted like the, like its spectacle to be was it in the mystery side of things or was it in the ghost side of things was it in the characters and how deep like some of the issues are we're dealing with like with travis's uh the kids issue of being bullied and you know and you know not wanting to kind of you know deal deal with all the you know, the qualms of life anymore and Lakeith having the grief thing. Like what does the movie want to point to? Cause right now it's got so much going on that it doesn't actually hone in on anything. And then like, you're getting all these different pockets of movie as we go along. So while it's not like the 2003 one, like why you said it, it was like, you know, very poorly, you know, lit as in like, you know, it's very telling that it was on sets and that kind of thing, making it feel disjointed or this where the movie's just all over the place on, you know, where it wants you to focus and you can feel it as you're watching the film. And like you said, it makes it feel like it's runtime. This movie felt like it took forever. It really I, did. It really did. I, it's been a while since I considered leaving a leaving a film because I was I had other things I could have been doing that were more important than watching this is the way I felt at some point. And I was in I was in film with one other guy. There's one me and this other dude in the theater watching this movie. I didn't know him. He was in the front, I was in the back. And at one point I considered leaving and I was like, "No, I got to stick this thing out." even though this thing is not very entertaining. And I looked down at where that guy was sitting and he was gone. He gone. He, go- he, he, he was go, he ghosted the film. Right. Mm-hmm. And all I could think was you lucky son of a bitch. He did it. He, he, he walked out and I was like, God, that could have been me. Dang it. So somebody left that film. Somebody made the better choice. And it was that guy. So well, see, I don't think it's bad enough to walk out of, but that's just because like, I actually kind of did like the ending, how all the elements came together, but <sighs> that was tough. That's a tough call because I almost, that's the the only... <laughs> but the ending's predictable too, right? It's terribly predictable. And, and, and oh, it stops being... or not. It's still, well, it does have it, elements of power to it. Yeah. But it stops being that it stops being everything. The movie was up to that point. It's not a, it's, it, it's not a mysterious ghost movie anymore. It's not a, a, you know, a character piece. It's not, you know, dealing with like the kids problem, you know, that Travis is having anymore. You know, you're barely touching on the whole grief thing until the very end of it. And it becomes a a Marvel movie light show. Everything is just super CGI, very bright and colorful and ghosts flying around and ghosts fighting against ghosts and, you know, sky beams and shit. Like, like all these things, you know, coming together in this film felt very out of place. Well, that's what I mean. This, they had to. I'm sure they were trying to do, to do two things: is make this movie and give some kind of semblance to the theme park ride, so people have something to. Like, oh, there's that. There's that. There's that. It's that's a tough thing to do when you're trying to shove two things together. Yeah, but but like, but doesn't the name of the movie alone do enough of that? Like, if you're a kid and you saw whatever haunted mansion movie that comes out in 2023, right, and then your parents take you to Disney. And you see a ride called the Haunted Mansion. It doesn't matter what was in the movie. The kid knows the name of the film. They're, oh my god, it's the Haunted Mansion. Let's oh, go I, see the I, ride. I agree, but 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 yeah. again, I think they think they've, they've, there's got to be links there, and it's it's quite obvious with all the sequels that we keep getting that suck. That like we're like, why was that in there? Was it that in there for a stupid link of that kind? Like you know, we we we've talked about yeah, it yeah. dozens and dozens of times, but I imagine that's it. But you're right. I think the movie it it because it it is you know dealing with. It goes hard into Ben's grief for a few minutes with showing you how his him and his wife met and then, you know, they get engaged and then we don't get anything for that for a while. And then we see kind of it falls apart and then we see mm-hmm. his wonderful speech about, 
she went to get ice cream and I, I yelled at her cause I had work to do and it's my, I should have been there with her. Yeah. And then, you know, it then someone immediately cracks a joke. I yep. think DeVito's character immediately cracks a joke to relieve the levity, which might work in that situation, but I don't think it well, works for the audience. So my, my theory there is, is that Dane DeVito wasn't cracking a joke because the script said so, because he forgot he was being filmed in a, on a movie set, and he just said something. <laughs> just said something. I mean, yeah, that's certainly possible. <laughs> uh, I can imagine that they were just like, Danny, say something here. When he says this, you say something. I don't care. Well, I don't know what it's going to be, but just say it. Sure, yeah. I, can see, I can see that as a thing. But then also in the end, it goes, I mean, jumping ahead just a little bit, in the, the the final moments of the of the actual story playing out it like it goes then it goes hard again into ben's grief and you know the the villain's trying to exploit his grief and use it against him and again like we we come in and out of these things and it's just i wish we would just focus solely on ben's grief but he's somehow mm-hmm. tied to this family and they need to figure out what's in ron's house and you know i wish we just stuck with that i mean i almost wish that it wasn't I almost wish that the, when the family had come, there was no – like there was a Rosario Dawson, whoever would have been playing the father and the kid and the son. I almost wish there would have been a full family unit instead of the father being – which yeah. shouldn't have been – that shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody when she's like – when he's – oh, he's talking to his father in the car. When he meant like on a phone or like she goes, no, he's dead. Like that shouldn't yeah. have been a surprise to anyone at that point, right? There was yeah. no way. Yeah, no. But it's – I mean again, it's like – your some writer thought it was it was clever to have clever. both both yeah. of them dealing with the same thing because oh, I want to make them a family in the end like okay we we saw that coming literally in the first five minutes of the movie yep so you know maybe may, maybe give us something we don't see coming from so far away but I, I you know what as funny as it is like I like Owen Wilson's character only because now I'm I, I can't figure out if I'm biased because I like Owen Wilson his his weird style of comedy or the character actually worked, which I don't think the character actually worked. Yeah, well, I think you're just ready for the next wed- Wedding Crashers, so I think you get excited <laughs> when you see Owen Wilson. Yes, sir. It's, uh, I think yeah, it's, yeah. it's the same Vince Vaughn effect. <laughs> you're, you're not wrong. I do get very excited. <laughs> but I don't think his character worked. Um, I, oh, you know, to be tr- truth be told, I didn't mind the, the Tiffany Haddish character either. I got to be honest about that. I didn't mind her character. Uh, I don't know, man. But you, like, you obviously hated that character. Well, it, it, it's just so... <laughs> Again, it was it's cliche, predictably and predictably annoying, and just she was very, just I don't know, just like the whole attitude of the character being very snippy and being very, I can do this, you know, you don't believe I can't, like we get it, and then she shows us that she can do stuff, but then like she kept on with that whole thing, and it's like come on, like like the whole astral projection talk they had, you know, like I can do it, and it's like yeah, you just you just talk to spirits and like were was possessed for for like five minutes, cool, yeah, no, we got you. Instead, it was like this, like this big deal the whole time if she could do these things or not. When you know, she proved it. Let, you know, go on from there. You know, at that point, you know, I, I'm in. I'm bought in at that point. You know, if that person does that thing in front of me, cool. All right, yeah. What else can you do? Show me. Instead, it was just this. It was just this thing and very loud characters. You know, all the way through again. But I think it's because like they wanted to, these people to be to be caricatures. They didn't want them to, you know, to to get through this movie, you know, on good acting and good script, they wanted them to be very like, you know, very large personalities on screen that people could latch on to, you know, for whatever reason, I think is where that comes from. I just don't think it was necessary, especially if you're trying to tell a, a more subtle ghost story, but then it becomes this big thing anyway at the end. So maybe it was meant to be that way the whole time. Well, it does it, make sense if you, if you go into the whole new Orleans thing, but they didn't No, they like didn't. It, was, no, no, no. it starts there. It starts there. Yeah. And people being excited about, you know, like the, the tour got, you know, the whole tour thing, you know, you know, tell us a ghost story or tell us about these ghosts. But then they like they never go back to it. You know, they just have a few characters that, you know, that are cleverly named in, in the spirit of New Orleans. But that's it. It stops there. Like Which there is. Even, I don't like, understand. Like if you have a movie set in New Orleans, it's it's got its own. It's got a very kind of unique lifestyle down there. Yeah, it's got, you know, 100%. it's kind of. So if you're going to do that, then do it. But otherwise, if you're not going to do it, then don't worry about having all these characters that are so heavily New Orleans. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know what I mean? Like that's the whole thing. Is like I couldn't find them. I couldn't find the right mixture there to like make me care mm-hmm. that we had one and not the other. Give me both or give me zero. That's kind of yeah. what I want there. But I, I mean, it's easy for me to keep on harping on things I didn't like. You know, but like I've already s- stated the things I do like. Right? You know, like I, I, I've already said some stuff. But like another thing that bothered me about this film. Is that it has all these rules to the house, right? Until it doesn't, until it doesn't need the rules, or it needs you to not follow the rules so it can do stuff. 
or until like, the rules don't matter, right? Yeah, course. yeah, all all these things. It, it, it does the that that stereotypical bad move of a movie of like here are the rules of what happens. We don't want them to leave. Blah blah blah. Until it's okay for the plot if they leave for a little while and come back later on. You know, like it's like you know, <laughs> make up your mind on this. And the whole sending them to a whole other location to find the you know the other thing they needed. You know, just have it in the fucking mansion already. Like why have why it, wouldn't it why wouldn't it have been in the mansion? Yeah, just have it be buried in some cellar or some attic there and then go find it and the ghost in the house is protecting it because he knows it can undo him. Like all these things, you know what I mean, could have been done better instead of like, nah, let's use this other set location and add like twenty minutes to the film because we have to send them someplace else and make up new rules for a minute. It's all these things that bother me as as I watch this movie and think about wow this could have been shorter if they wouldn't have had. I was thinking that same thing. Well, you already just you have the mansion just lit. Why yeah. can't everything just be in the? Why does it make sense that this guy is in another mansion somewhere, but he's still kind of ruling this one too? It doesn't. Yeah. What the sense does that make? Exactly. <laughs> but I, I I agree with you and this. But yeah. like also is so let's talk about aesthetics for one second. Like yeah sure. So I didn't like the Haunted Mansion 2003, how everything looked like it almost I almost felt like I was sitting in an audience as an audience member on as in a, in a play in the first yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. It all looks so fakely lit. And I'll admit the one the one thing I loved about the first Haunted Mansion, well, 2003 was Terrence Stamp because he's mm-hmm. such a character actor that like he's so dry and line delivery is perfect that I was like, ah, oh, they should have. I don't know. I don't even know if he's alive anymore, but I was like, ah, oh, they should have got Terrence Stamp for this one. But he was like one of the great, like few bright spots of that first film in 2003. But okay, yeah. they didn't really have that kind of weird, like Butler character in this one that we needed. They did. They, they just, they subbed him out for kind of other quirky, you know, caricatures of Louisiana, but yeah, not really him. And it's just, it's kind of, it's, I'm missing it, but also I did, like the way that the mansion looked okay in, yeah in the, in the interior like at the hallways and the mm-hmm. rooms i i did like that i did i thought that was very i thought that was very well done how how they you know sit, i thought set design was actually pretty cool agreed and and the the cgi in this is good and is pretty good and it better be for 150 million dollar budget but it, it's you know there are there are some upsides here but they're they're not the things that matter the most right you know like like the haunted mansion to you feeling like you know it looks good and you know that that is important don't get me wrong but it's not the thing that the movie focused on the movie focused on the characters and the mystery not the mansion they were just in the mansion i think that's a big problem i think you know as they titled the film haunted mansion and then have you explore in this place at times they i don't think they did a good enough job of making that the subject if that's what they wanted it to be around instead it was about the characters and the mystery and that's where the movie really felt flat. And I just think that a lot of time was spent on there and on that instead of it being, you know, where it should have been or what they could have done differently with the film to make it more exciting for, you know, whoever's watching it. I agree. I agree that they should have used more of the mansion. They should have used, they should have almost had the mansion as like a character of itself yes. instead of, yes, that's what I thought I was getting, but I, instead I of kind of know. an irrelevant kind of set piece that are just in that really just, it just didn't really have any like the rules applied sometimes like they mm-hmm. when they when they all slept in that room after midnight like the ghost wouldn't bother like why wouldn't the ghost bother you at the midnight like yeah. you, why, why does that make any kind of sense at all yep uh there's stuff like that that really bothered me but i mean it's also that i did th- i mean again i thought that was pretty cool was again not to get so sciency but his camera i thought that was kind yeah. of an interesting yeah, how you could like capture the spectral images with what he was like again i don't that's not possible right please tell me that's not possible i don't know i mean you're, you're not asking the right guy that question but either way yeah i agree with you it, it's an interesting it's an interesting concept and makes sense why that guy would be there at that point i guess you know what i mean but it it's still not enough to make the movie fall into like a positive category you know what i mean on its own right no i totally understand that and the one thing that bothered me was i don't know if it bothered you like when they, you remember when they walked in the seance room behind the picture? Yes. And someone turned the knob on the barrel that then dropped the oil? Yes. And without turning the oil off, <laughs> someone threw a match in the oil. And I was like, that would just blow that room up. Yeah. yeah. Like they're, all, they're, they're all dead. The, the mansion's burned down. End of movie. Yep. Like, I don't know why that bothered me so much for like the next hour. I mean, I, I mean we got nine new ghosts now. All right. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, that would have been it. But yeah, of course. It's just, it's a weird. Like I don't mind the seance room, and I don't mind we actually like in that like the first scene in the seance room. We learn that 
well, maybe Hadris' character isn't completely a joke. Maybe she can yeah. do some things. Is that's kind of cool, but also, but it's again, I'm not sure it works. I'm not sure that vibes with the rest of the movie. Yeah, well, they couldn't um, have two frauds in the same movie. That'd have been that'd have been lazy. Well, I mean, yes, and I mean, in a in a movie made about a theme park ride for Disney, I mean, is it lazy or is it just par of the course? But maybe. it's that's yeah, also true. it's, but that kind of goes along with you know, um. What look Le- Le- uh what's his name? Oh, Ben. Yeah. How he's just he doesn't he's kind of let his life just turn to shit. Yeah. Because what happened is he's you know, and I I mean I I guess I did appreciate, especially you know the one that he gives about what happened to his wife. We all knew that was coming, and I mean it had to come because she wasn't in his life anymore, and we didn't know yep. exactly know what what happened. But mm-hmm. and then the the speech he gives to the boy at the end about you know about grief. I thought that was kind of touching too because yeah. because what it did was he was talking to the kid as a father would talk to a son. And of course, mm-hmm. that's what they're going to become is, you know, stepson and stepfather, but you know, I do like when arcs kind of do the thing of coming full full arcish and you know, you and Roger know I like the more of the emotional stuff where people have to well, yeah. come out of their own funk to deal with maybe to help other people deal with their things, but I did like that. How I mean, I, I didn't like the, the, the situation that the kid who is supposed to be this outspoken, always dressing in the top attire, smart kid, was being duped. Mm-hmm. But I don't know how. I don't know the ratio to you're a brilliant kid and you know your father's gone, dead. But maybe there's some small hope that he's here. Like I don't know that. Like is yeah. that uh, the way they the way they presented Travis to us? I'm not sure he would have fallen for that. Yeah, yeah, I gotcha. Because he's he's a little too smart for that, is what I'm trying mm-hmm. to say. Is he just he would have seen through that, especially knowing that they needed another soul. Like he would have seen right through that. But that's again, that's getting into me and the nerdy science of it all. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess the, the the point there is grief can do some can can do some some hard stuff to people. So that that's also in play there too. Well, I think it does matter as far as the movie's concerned because you know the motivations are off. However, well. And what you said is absolutely a thing. Grief is a real mother. But it's also, you have to somehow in the movie tell us that and why it's affecting these people as bad as it is. Or it's out of place to us because we don't know why. We don't know any of this Mm -hmm. stuff via character conversations or what their actions or, you know, anything like that or flashbacks, stuff Mm -hmm. like that. But it's just one of those things that I just don't think played the way that the way that Disney intended for it to play. Yeah. I can't stop thinking about the hundred fifty million dollar budget, and it's <laughs> it's awful return so far. My goodness, oh, yeah. it's low, man. It's low. Someone else at Disney just got fired for this one. I'm sure that someone you know. Uh, they, yeah, I'm sure. I just with with a few well, small changes, this movie could have been a whole lot better. I mean, some changes. I don't know about small changes, but some some changes, yes. And I don't think there's. There's not much more you could have done to make it worse, in my opinion. I well, think. Let me ask you: really Do we need low. Jamie Lee Curtis for this? No, that could have been no. anyone, right? That could have been literally anybody in that. They could have been. Well, I mean, same. You can say the same about about Jared Leto. You know, he doesn't even look like him. I don't know if that's a CGI thing of him or if that's you know actually him in makeup. Like, I don't know what's happening there, but like, there's a it definitely didn't need to be Danny DeVito. Definitely didn't need to be Jamie Lee Curtis. Definitely didn't need to be Jared. You know, like like all these people we're gonna name. I think Lakeith. I think. Owen Wilson is, is is a good big actor face to k- get people to show up to this thing. I think we're, you know, I think Rosario Dawson. I think that's what you need. I think everything everything else could have been, you know, just some, you know, some local talent that's around that you know, you know, that you want to bring into this that could really, you know, have a shot and then make this movie way less of a budget budget intensive and then lean into the good actors that you grabbed. I don't know. It, it's there's a lot that could have been done here and not much that would have made it, made it a bad thing. Well, this in something I want to talk about in the, in the Nimona, a closer look we're going to do after this one is mm-hmm. that things change and Hollywood isn't, isn't adapting well to the whole big budget. We don't need them anymore because a lot of people have streaming and no longer go to the theater. Hollywood's not adapting is I think you hit the nail on the head is this probably was not as big a budget as it, ended up being until they got into production and all these people wanted to be part of it and, and were accepting paychecks and all yeah. of a sudden the budget's ballooned, you know, another fifty million dollars that you didn't originally want to spend, but now you have to spend because you gotta have the cast. But I think we're to the point okay, so Rosario Dawson, 
<clears throat> Owen Wilson, Tiffany Haddish, Danny DeVito, Jamie Lee Curtis, Jared Leto, whatever they're going to do in film, they've done. Oh, okay, yeah. They've yeah. already made names for themselves. It's not, I mean, they're all kind of on the back nine. I would, mm-hmm. I would, I would say even Lakeith is on the back nine. He's made his, he's made his amazing movies and he's been nominated. So whatever he, like, this isn't, this is not to him like a, like an Oscar chaser is my yeah, point. Yeah. So all these people are, there's not one person in the cast, maybe the kid, because he's excited to be on the big uh-huh. screen, but there's not one person in the cast that was like not already kind of, in the second half, the back nine of their of their career. Yeah. So that's the one thing I noticed too is like, why do I? Why does anyone care about any of these people being in this movie when you could literally replace them? Like you said, Owen Wilson is probably necessary. Rosario Dawson. Um, I would imagine those two, and maybe Lakeith. And that's mm-hmm. it. Every, I mean, everyone, everyone else could have been could have been anybody else. I think. You could have given those roles to bit players or people that were looking for a chance to step up, and mm-hmm. abso- absolutely, you could have done that. I know. I just don't know. Hollywood somehow is has not understood that just because you put big stars in movies, it doesn't draw people in. Maybe it did up to like 2010, but after that, I think people just you can put a hundred names in a movie, but I don't think people care as much as they used to care about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, every actor, every famous person has their fans. Don't get me wrong, but. And again, you know, she's a fine actress, but I don't think anyone's going to say, you know, at this point, you know, oh, Jamie Lee Curtis is in that new Disney Disney movie, A Haunted Mansion. I have to see it now if they weren't already going to go see it to begin with. And you can say that about a lot of these people in this movie. I agree. I, I would agree with that. It's, it's weird to me that that's what they obviously they they put a lot on the cast. Yeah. Yeah. To pull people in. And it just hasn't. And it's. It's one of those weird things where I, it just is very strange to me. But so let's let's talk about the actual plot of just one second before we move into scoring. Let's talk about the actual okay. plot of. So this is our guy Crump. We, as you kind of find out, the backstory is is kind of a bad dude. I, I don't want to spoil oh, who he is and where it comes from, but he's trying to collect all these souls so he can. It's always it's only a gain for him. Mm-hmm. So I have one question for you, Chris. That also has to do with like most horror films that involve a poltergeist or some kind of supernatural spirit is why do you mess with the people you need to kill? Just fucking kill them. Yeah. You know, right. Like, like if you need to do X or Y thing, just do the thing, right? Not everything else that made you susceptible to not be able to do your thing. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And then on top of that, I think the only one he needed to like to wine and dine uh, effectively would be, you know our, our our leads character because he needs he needs him to do it willingly right everything else yeah you could have just like just ended people right <laughs> like for lack of a, of a better term but then this would, wouldn't be a pg movie would it you know what i mean so it i guess it kind of it depends on why why you're making this film to begin with you know you're trying to sell ride tickets and all this other stuff so well, right of course but it's like all yeah. those it's like in all those films like insidious or all the they all start the same way you know all the conjuring of like in the beginning a door opens and then there's a rocking chair just rocking back and forth. And that's mm-hmm. just, that's, that's the first kind of kind of scare for the first. And then, you know, 20 minutes later, there's another scare, but like, why mess with them? If you, if you intend on killing them, just kill them. Like yeah. we wouldn't have a movie otherwise. And I get that, but mm-hmm. that's the problem with most horror films. Is just, why would you just toy with, just kill them? My God, especially yep. and the guys that need hundreds of souls. He needs one soul to do yeah, what he needs yeah. to do. So also I thought, I want to run this by you before we score it is if you make a small change in maybe he's just someone whose career hasn't panned out the way Ben's career hasn't panned out the way he wanted to. And he's, he no longer has people interested in his photography because it's he, even though he knows it's not a joke when he has the equipment, he built it. It's not a joke. People are like, yeah, it's fake. I think if I was looking at this objectively, this script, I would have switched it to the grief lays on rosario's character and the son's character over the over the father that's where the grief would have laid and when they moved into this house they knew they had a problem and when they invite when they invite this camera guy to find out what's you know like hey someone told me that you do this we'd like to get a picture of what's haunting us so we can figure out how to best do it and i've already i've already talked to a a a priest who's going to bless us and all that stuff is you know then he then 
not only can not only is that create a situation where he can't leave because he has to watch these people and make sure that she doesn't succumb to the grief that she's or the kid is like that's I think that would have been the more interesting movie is instead of him being so far lost in his grief is yeah because it's already built in with the fact that they wanted to find a different life because they lost the husband and father it's already it's, it's mm-hmm. built in why would you why would you all of a sudden just take a to take a side route and add another grief column to it. Like, I just don't understand why would you have done that? Yeah. I, I just, I don't think they wanted, I don't think they wanted Lakeith's character to come in and save anybody. I think, I think, I think they wanted the lead to have the, to have this, this deep thing he was dealing with. And for him, for that person to, to be this, the one that was rescued in some way, shape or form, whether it be by the story itself and him coming to terms with everything and understanding that it's necessary and all this other stuff or not. I don't think I think that's what that's that's the angle that they went with, obviously. So I think that that's where they wanted to be. All right. Question number two is rewatchability. Does it have oh, any? God. I'll never watch it again, but I guess like I don't know. I mean, because okay, so because of the high octane third act action climax, yeah, because <laughs> you know, lights on screen, ghosts doing things is cool, man, you know. So like you could watch it again for that. But there's no more mystery, you know, involved. There's no nothing with you when you on a second viewing. There's nothing you're gonna see that you didn't see the first time. Because this movie is not a show movie; it's a tell movie. So it tells you everything along your ride, and then that's it. So, yeah, it, it's not something that you'll watch again for any reason besides the cool lights at the end of it. I I, I agree. It's one of those ones that just I can't say I wouldn't watch it again, but it's gonna be. I'm going to be asleep in 20 minutes. I just want to put something on while I fall asleep, but it's not going to be like a dedicated rewatch only because like, I I will admit like some of those ghosts were kind of terrifying looking, but then again, this is a Disney movie. That's not. So I I, I wondered why they put so much effort into making those look terrifying when the long run, I'm not sure it mattered. Nope. Because it wasn't, you know, I mean, you're not, this is a kid's movie based on a theme park, right? (laughs) So Mm -hmm. what's the point in making them? So some of them so terrifying that's kind of the polar it's just the polar shift in the movie is like are you making a horror film or are you making a kids a kids movie yeah. decide and then proceed from there but i don't know so if we're moving to score this um see i've thought a lot about this because and i'll admit i watched this on friday with people in my office but i fell asleep immediately like i was <laughs> I, I was out no. dude well all the all the like i don't want to act i don't want to sound like a bro or anything but all like the the increased running i'm doing and lifting and trying to like get all my work and workouts for the day. And like, that's really conking me out at the end of the day. So I was just mm-hmm. out, but I'd, I'd rewatch it again. But so I didn't hate this movie and I think you did, but I didn't hate as much as you did. I just, mm-hmm. but it, it absolutely feels the runtime. Oh yeah. It, oh, it abs- every bit of two hours. It feels like two hours. But, however, there's some nuggets of some cool things here. I think like Keith is great. I always like Rosario Dawson. She always, I just, she always gives a solid performance. Uh, I like for you know for my own reasons. I like Owen Wilson. I didn't quite understand why Jamie Lee Curtis was there. I didn't quite understand why they made half decisions that they made as far as the story is concerned. But uh, to me, this is a three. Okay, all right. And it's like <laughs> it almost sounded like it hurt. It hurt you to give well, it that I score. Didn't, I don't want to give a Disney movie a three, but I don't think it deserves any better than that. I was gonna say. I mean, it, it gets what it earns, right? So I don't know. Maybe we're being tough on a on a film that wasn't trying to be anything spectacular, but you know what? It's 150 million dollars spent. It's two hours of my time wasted, and the movie just wasn't as fun as what I wanted it to be. I mean, it wasn't amusement park ride fun, that's for sure. And with everything that happens in this film, you know, the disjointed feeling of what this movie is trying to be, trying to throw it all out the window at the end of the movie anyway. Aside for a couple like tidbits of good acting and you know some relatable subjects, you know with the grief being in play, the movie's not good. It, it does feel like it's long, it's long run time, which is a problem because if you're enjoying the film, it's not going to feel long. Um, we're actually on the same mark. I'm, I'm going to give this thing a three. It's not a zero. It's not a one. It's a little bit better than a two, but it's. It, it wasn't an easy watch. This one is not one I'll rewatch and, or nor recommend unless, you know, they really want to see, you know, Lakeith play, you know, play a lead role and do a good job because that's the only thing really going for this film. Well, but if you if 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 your goal is to see Lakeith 
in a lead role and do a good job. There's, there's, oh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's better films there's, for it. There's 10 other movies that you could watch that would yeah, satisfy true. that. And I wanted, one, th- one thing, I th- for, I'm looking at my notes. Why was this released when it was? This feels like, I mean, the movie set in fall, is, or is, this feels like a fall movie to me. This feels like a October, November movie to me. This does not feel um, like a, does not feel like a summer movie to me. But so, maybe, maybe my brother is off. I don't know. Well, don't forget, fall time is not Disney time. That's not when you go to Disneyland. That's true, I guess. That's very true. Is, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, the, first I, one, the first one was released in November, so I just wondered why. It was the Thanksgiving the, weekend, I think. The first one was released in 2003 when you know the bottom line wasn't as much of a pressing issue for Disney. That's true. That's very true. <laughs> I just I wonder some of the decisions that they made, but it's it's weird how God, I never would have guessed that we're giving Disney movies. I mean, all those those Disney sports movies I watched that were like 2002 to like mm-hmm. 2007, they're all th- those are all like sevens, eight, and nines. I never yeah, would have I mean, guessed in my wildest dreams I'd be we'd be giving Disney movies and the animated Disney stuff like less than a seven. Mm-hmm. Never would have guessed that. But this movie is. Were you surprised when I said three? I, I was actually. I, I thought you were going to go four and a half, you know, or somewhere no, around that area. I wanted to, but it's just <sighs> one of the things that I think is damning is the most damning about a film is when it feels its runtime. Oh yeah, because oh, it's yeah. Fa- it's failed to suck you in. And so you're not immersed. You're not, and in the theater when you're not really on your phone, you're not, you know, you, like you should be sucked in every time. But yeah. it's just, I just wanted more from this movie, and I, I yep. told you and Roger that I just, I just wanted more from it. And it's just like what this doesn't have is, I guess they might be counting on. Oh, I saw this when I was when I was a teenager. Now I'm taking you, my son, to see it now, like 20 years later. Like what? No, what? What? what do you actually? Does anyone actually do that anymore? I have an interesting question for you. Shoot. You want to talk about that time you thought this movie was going to be good? I thought this movie was going to make money. I didn't think it was going to be any good. I did. I was surprised when you guys thought it was not going to make any money. I'm like, I don't know. It's a Disney movie. Haunted Mansion did okay for itself. I think this one will do okay for itself. But I was wrong on that one, too. I This has been a bad time for me guessing. I'm usually much better like, I'm usually much better like industry analyst than I have been over the past yeah, you know, yeah. couple of months. But but again, well, the, world's, well, the world's in a weird topsy turvy situation. So the in- the industry is doing some weird stuff right now, though, too. So yeah, so that's you know, yeah. in, in my defense, that's what's going on. But gotcha. Yeah, I'm really disappointed in Haunted Mansion. I just it seems like Disney doesn't care. It seems like they're going down the Netflix path of they just don't care. They just want to have it done by a certain date and get it out. Yeah, I mean, that guy who left my film was the smartest guy in that room, that's for sure. He was. Of the two of you, he was the smartest he guy was. in the room. He was. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, Chris, thank you for joining me tonight. This has been 342A of For Love of Cinema, a. a movie podcast. Each new episode posts every Friday, Tuesday and Friday morning at 5 a.m. on the podcast service of your choice of the following five Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music. Please leave us a comment or two, rate, subscribe. Every little bit helps. More importantly, thank you for listening. Check out the show on Twitter or now X at Love Cinema Pod. I'm at Grayson Maxwell One. And I'm Christopher Ball. Roger is at, at Rod Stillian. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, always posting things on social media. I posted some pretty interesting stories this week. One of them is about Nolan and his sound quality in his past couple of films, and he, he talks mm-hmm. about it. Yeah. Uh, one there's a couple stories I post about the Barbie movie and it's some really interesting kind of if you like those movies you should definitely check those out because they're they're really kind of an interesting uh, like filler supplemental to the movies that you watched and liked uh, check us out on always YouTube and Facebook and send us an email to for the love of cinema podcast at gmail.com and next week we're taking a look at Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem and yeah. On Apple TV, still a Michael J. Fox movie. Why do you think they called it still? Mm, Not falling for this one, Chris. Not falling for this (laughs) one.